And I guess I'll start by saying that one of the things we had always talked about when we talk about culture and we talk about employees and recruiting was that you have to have a compelling advantage and that for many employees, when it came to recruiting and retention, salary and starting wage was third on the list. They wanted culture, they wanted to be part of a family, uh, they wanted to know there was room for advancement. And it sounds like at this conference that that doesn't fly anymore. It was all about the money. We had two panelists, Tom Robinson uh, <clears throat> was the first to mention it and it was salary, and another person came up after me and said that they have already raised their wage four times since the start of the year. So I don't know if that's pandemic related, I don't know if that's supply chain related and the labor crunch related, uh, but it sounds like a key motivator now for attracting retaining employees is starting wage and salary. Would you guys agree with that? Oh, definitely, we've definitely seen that. We by um, area, depending upon what the wage is, we will adjust because mm -hmm. You're seeing McDonald's at twenty dollars an hour. You know what are you going to do about that? And that's the employee that will leave you for you know a dollar. And it's we we went high in some places. Some of them make more money than me if you go by the hour. So it's <laughs> and uh, you know what? I'm sorry. Uh, you know Joy from our panel this morning, but I forgot to introduce Brad Shivington with Highs. Uh, Brad has been coming to NAG for for a couple of years and has done this session and helped out with our sessions. Uh, so welcome. Thank, Thank you for you doing guys. this. Thank you. Um, I would agree that um, the marketplace is just dictating that rise in starting wages and, and that employee is looking and it, it's become more, as you said, it's become more of a dominant factor where it used to be a little bit lower on the tier. I think the other ele elements are still important, but that wage is one of the key factors they're looking at. Okay. So feel free to chime in. Uh, we'd like the, this session to be interactive. Uh, on the salary side, do you guys agree with that for the most part? Is, uh, have your wages been going up? Do you have to, uh, what's the, str the, the fight like to, to find good starting and uh, recruiting good employees? Doug? Uh, minimum wage in upstate New York at twelve fifty an hour, um, but in Pennsylvania, where we do business, the minimum wage is seven and a quarter. We don't start anybody at seven and a quarter in Pennsylvania because you can't. So we found initially it didn't really matter how much we were paying people to start. We still struggled to get people, but since that, you know, the market has driven the wages higher. Okay. Anyone else? Yep. <coughs> Um, we've, ra we've raised wages five times in the last 18 months. Um, three of them were minimum wage increases, um, which we took everybody up. But then um, I'm doing wage surveys now literally every eight to ten weeks. In fact, I, I got a note reminder today to send that out to do another one April 1st. We just raised wages again in, in February. Um, and we're in Illinois and Missouri, so we have two different minimum wages too. We're at, I don't even know what minimum wage is, but we're above it at both, in both states. We haven't even given raises in the last year and a half because we're raising wages so often that our, our wage, and we raise across the board. Um, but it, I agree with Doug, it's not helping us recruit more employees. Um, we're, we're still losing employees to job hopping. Uh, I lost an assistant manager last week for 50 cents. Um, been a five-year employee for 50 cents she left so mm -hmm. I know the wages are important but I, I don't think it's helping so, so uh, um, along those lines then uh, one of the things someone else mentioned was signing bonuses and it's in, it was interesting to hear there were definitely two different opinions some people said they were in favor of them some people said they weren't uh, is there any right answer uh, do you guys uh, do anything like that does anyone in the audience do anything like that we, we, Global has um, a bonus, but they have to stay a certain amount of time before realizing what it is. Mm -hmm. As well as um, the financial piece, one of the other things that we had begun doing is really investing back into the employee or our site level staff team. Um, at one point, you had to be with Global a certain amount of years 
<clears throat> or a year, I think, before you could take advantage of the, um, the education program, which we provide to all employees. Recently, we went to even part-time employees were able to take advantage of X amount of dollars per year toward a higher education. Um, we do that. We, and Dora actually just told me that we were talking about, or well, there was some discussion about further investment in employees by teaching them, you know, really reviewing like 401k, what does that mean? You know, how much money can you make as a young person? You know, you're never going to miss the beer money, but you'll, at a certain point, you'll, you'll be glad that you had made that investment in yourself. So I, I think really feeling like we're investing back in those people is, has really helped us a lot quite recently. Okay. I think for us, um, we've tried a lot of the tactics of so signing, uh, referral, retention bonuses, and, um, I, you know, limited success with those, um, much as she just mentioned, is communicating, connecting with the employees and letting them know all of the things that you have available. Um, we, we assume they know it, they get it in orientation or whatever, and uh, finding out that they don't know about the, the medical, the tuition, some it's of the a, other things It's very overwhelming at that first thing, anyway. So to keep that communication and trying to find ways to establish that connection point uh, with the associates. And really, at the end of the day, um, it hasn't changed a lot over time, but the connection between that store manager and the staff is the key to the relationship and, mm -hmm. and the commitment to connect, because that manager is the face of the company. And that came up in our HR uh, group, Daryl, uh, that it, it was another thing that was said. People don't leave good jobs. They leave uh, bad managers. Mm -hmm. and. So you could even have those good, you have those good programs. It's it's still managing and understanding the people, understanding the managers, and uh, heading off that bad leader, you know, who can influence uh, people who forget some of those things. Um, but we've learned a lot. Uh, we covered a lot at the conference. We covered the robotics and culture, and learned how to cool your stores using cinder blocks, which you probably didn't expect when you came to this conference. Um, but I wanted to get uh, your input. What did you guys learn? What stood out to, to both of you guys being experts in the field? A couple of things that uh, you're going to take away from the conference. Let me go. Sure. Um, I think one of the things is, as we've seen over this week and as saw the store tours is technology is advancing rapidly and about ease and efficiency and yeah. things. Um, it, it's how do you integrate that into your business with your customer and with your associates that either eases the operation for the associate or the customer. There's things that are evolving and coming. You know, some of them, um, when we looked at um, the valet store, it's like in that particular setting, it could make sense. But I don't know in a traditional rural, if we have a lot of rural locations, I don't know if that would have the same application at this point in time. Yeah, and they, that was one of the questions in the panel. Would they say 5,000? Will you see 5,000 of these stores in the next five years? And the guy, I think the right answer was no, because and the people in this room are the ones that would be implementing those stores. So mm -hmm. if we're saying no, uh, then it's probably not going to happen. Uh, but how about for you, Joy? Well, from a food, per, food service perspective, um, what, what I kind of gathered after speaking with some of the folks is Everybody wants to be in the food business. One of the most important things we can do is set up tools um, so that if you know the person that was working today didn't show up tomorrow, there'd be proper training tools and things like that in place. And I think that's something we really didn't discuss at any length, but I think that really kind of like setting the foundation uh, for understanding how you're actually going to execute programs is, is critical. Uh, you had mentioned before, you know, you start slowly. I completely agree with that. Uh, but I think that the a lot of the inf uh, information where you should start is basically in your analytics, based on when you what do you want to be, who do you want to be, uh, if you're going to be that store that provides food service to like the commuter uh, traffic trade. That's going to be different than the person who wants to go ahead and be, you know, catering for offices and things like that. Two totally different things. But you have to start somewhere. And I wouldn't be fearful about starting programs because it's not so much failing as it is learning. And once you learn that this didn't work, that's OK. So then you go to the next thing. 
And we're surrounded by a bunch of people who all want to help each other out, and I think that's pretty special, uh, myself included. And you know, we have open doors at our stores that we're proud of what we've done and really happy to share. And I think that you know, if we can all just leave knowing that we have these great contacts at our fingertips, I, you know, that's really the big takeaway for me. It was phenomenal. And along those lines, if uh, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, if you're in an area where you know, pizza is uh, a top seller. You can be a pizza retailer there, but 50 miles away, it might not be a pizza store. It's, exactly. it's okay to be a different store there. It's totally fine. We have a large umbrella program, and we pretty much pick based on the attributes of the store, what elements are available. Every, we look at everything from space to labor to storage to who the distributor is and how's it going, and we plug in the programs that way. And we try it, and like I tell you before, we make mistakes, and oops, we should have done this. So we put it in. We're not saving lives, we're making salami sandwiches here. <laughs> you know, but we need to respect the process, so. Yeah, I, I think for us, um, food is a journey. It's a process. I think your evolution and learning and trying, we take the same approach. Um, and we have some core signature items that are consistent, but we also tailor to the niche of the market, and the size of the facility and the complexity of the offer and the equipment plays into that. I told someone, uh, I think I was at G-Man this morning, uh, I happened to stop by, uh, I was in Maryland, I stopped at a Dash Inn and a Highs for lunch and I emailed Brad and I said, hey, stop by, here's my daughter, stop by for, for lunch. And I expected, oh, you know, how was it? But I got, who served you, what was it, how was the experience, was it any good, what did you think, what would you change? I was like, man, I just had lunch, I just wanted to say hi. But that's how you get better. Yeah. It's, it, you know, it, yeah. it's another set of eyes, how did you like it, what was the experience like? And that happens all the time. The same thing happened uh, with Blackie at uh, Dash and um, uh, Mr. Wills. Uh, again, what could we do better? And that's the journey, that Joy mentioned, that's the journey. And, and you have to let things mature too, mm -hmm. like you, we look at things 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, did it earn a spot, did it not, should we keep it, should we not, and, and a lot of times we just get rid of things because it's not the right thing, but we don't know till we try. Mm -hmm. uh, along those lines, uh, the, what did you think of the energy shakes that uh, Tony Sparks talked about at Kirby's? Uh, I think they're popular. Pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, they, they are definitely growing, in, uh, in I see them all over now, and you have something similar, I believe. Yeah, they're working on them uh, in one of the programs that we have at the pilot, see how it goes, but they make some int pretty interesting. And those are high retail rings. Those are not cheap drinks, right? They are. But we, yes, absolutely. They absolutely are. Okay. I think we do more with the bean to cup, though, than we mm. do with the actual full serve. So uh, that was one of our breakout sessions. So this, I'll let this flow organically, the bean to cup. It's everywhere. We saw it at the 7-Eleven store. They had, I think, three plus a cappuccino uh, mm -hmm. and espresso machine. You're, I know you're investing in bean-to-cup. I'm not sure. Are you guys doing bean-to-cup? Yeah, we are uh, into bean-to-cup, and we will have completed our rollout across all locations by June of this year. Ten years ago, this was something that was, uh, people were just learning about Kerrig. Uh, but it's, it, 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 I mean, is this it? Is this here to stay now? Do you see this ever going back to a drip? Or do you see a combination of, of such? Because 7-Eleven still does have a drip program to go along with the bean to cup. In, in our experience, we tried with both and we, we evaluated, and we had some locations that had bean to cup and had some drip brew for uh, specialty flavors and things. And we found uh, once the, the customer migrated to the bean to cup, they didn't go back, uh, knowing that it's fresh ground, fresh brew, the quality that they're getting. Mm -hmm. The store operators, and we'd have traditional long-term customers that say, oh, I don't want that, I, you know. You win them over with trial. And um, we, I don't see for, for where we're at that uh, a return to drip. I think Bean Cup's here to stay and okay. probably other evolutions of that. Okay. Yeah, I Angry. think the same for Global. We don't, it has too many advantages. Anyone here doing bean to cup? Or are you guys looking at it? Uh, what machines do you use? Bun. Bun. Okay. Uh, same thing. Do you just have bean to cup, or do you still have a drip? Okay. Okay. 
and if I can get on my soapbox for just a second, can stores out west please add fresh milk to your program? I went oh, to yeah. a store here, and they only had powder, I had a little bit of More milk. cream. And the guy thought I was crazy. I said, do you have milk? He said, no, we got the powder. Sugar my diet. Powder. This is in 1970. Come on, get some milk. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, he thought I was crazy. So if I can influence at least one of your chains, I promise I'll shop there. And I, I drink a lot of coffee. All right, so uh, uh, next, what, would, uh, what do you have next on your list? Um, I think in the, uh, the loyalty discussions, I think mm -hmm. looking at the programs and um, the conversation this morning about the data, the evolution of it, the, um, the ease, the engagement piece of it. I mean, those are all things as we've migrated in our loyalty program, we're looking at uh, what's the next stage, what's the next mm -hmm. level to connect with that consumer and get that stickiness with them and, and the frequency and the use and add value to the programs that make them want to use it. And we started with traditional cards and pretty much everything now is through the phone and the app digital on that piece. It's, uh, and that was mentioned here at the conference, it prob COVID probably accelerated the adaptation of technology in certain areas by five years. I think everyone knew they had to, you know, we'll get, we have to get an app and we have to have mobile ordering, we have to be able to order on the app, but they weren't really doing it or they tested it. But if you're not, I mean, at this point, if you're not pretty much for far along in that process, you're behind. Would you agree with that? Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, is everyone here doing mobile apps? Uh, or online ordering? No, just, okay. Um, we mentioned this a little bit this morning, Joy, with the third party folks, that is a component. So yes, they represent your brand and if it falls, they, they may hold it against you, but who gets that sales data? Is there, if, if I order through you know, Uber Eats and I'm, I'm getting highs, do you, is, when you order from an airline, if you go uh, buy from Orbitz, for example, and you, you can enter in your United number, so you get credit with your loyalty number, are those third-party apps allowing you to do that so you can understand your customer and know what they're buying? We're not live with third-party delivery. Okay. We're in the process right now. Joy may have. I know um, the gentleman that runs our Grubhub things mm -hmm. can say who you know who's buy you know who bought it and all those kinds of things. So he sees what gets pulled out. Okay. Because we have to deal with those customers when they have a bad experience. Mm -hmm. And yeah, they're calling you. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. and, okay. All right, so any feedback? Uh, if I go around the room, if I would ask uh, Daryl, I'll put you on the spot. Uh, what was your biggest takeaway? Um, no, I was saying that uh, on the labor front, I found it very interesting that yesterday Alex said he slowed down the hiring process mm -hmm. when everyone else, including us, has sped up the hiring process. So I'm going to take a long look at that. I actually talked to him last night and going to mm -hmm. reach out to him next week and get more information because it's just, it's a, it goes back to what we talked about yesterday. Mm -hmm. Are they leaving <laughs> because of the poor? supervisor so, so I'm gonna look at it from that point of view and he was the in our meet, in our breakout session I had mentioned that there was a chain that they get to an interview process he said at, at one point only one out of 20 and when they added in some programs to one out of 10 even passes the initial screening process and never makes it to an interview and they haven't compromised on that they still believe in that and it, it seems to be working for them yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, try something different all right. Hey, John. I got. Oh, you, question. You, Sorry. you want to share takeaways, John? Hey, uh, Todd Watkins with uh, the Kent Companies. My biggest takeaway is I feel like we, as convenience store operators, are missing an opportunity. It was shared that during during the COVID epidemic and everything that our our C stores really stepped it up and provided a service to the communities and were really hometown heroes. 
And then you do breakout sessions and you hear things like, hey, you know, C stores are at the bottom of the food chain when it comes to retail. And I just don't think that's right. I feel like we as operators are missing an opportunity if we don't really beef up our employees, our team members, and make them feel like they are, continue to be servants to the community. We're, you know, we're fueling America, we're fueling the people, hardworking Americans come through our stores and we give them what they need to go out there and get the job done and keep this country running. And we really need to, to use that sound bite and pump up our team members. And that's going to help with our retention. That's going to make people want to come and work in our businesses. If we can get that attitude in our people, this you're below, you're less than, is not acceptable. Okay? So I, that was one of my big takeaways that I want to take home and really try to, to put that to work for us. Thank you. Totally agreed. And uh, I think if you'd be available to be the spokesperson for the industry's mo I think I would appreciate it. Because it can't be said enough, right? The, for, it, it has been at the bottom of the food chain, but every time there's a crisis in this country, whether it's a natural disaster, Katrina, uh, pandemic, where are the lights on? The lights are on at your stores, mm -hmm. right? And the, 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 the country knows that. They just gravitate toward their local convenience store. And part of it's because of the offering, but part of it's because of the relationships, right? I mean, they know uh, that's my neighbor working there, or that's, that's my friend, that's a guy I went to high school with. And they can get, you know, coffee's always hot, the food's always fresh. All right, so uh, any other takeaways? I'll put, let me put my new NAG chairman on the spot. Vern. Hang on, Vern. <laughs> got time? Hang on. Uh, I'm going to say that my biggest takeaway from this thing is more of a personal nature. In business. I've been very reluctant uh, about, uh, you know, becoming more a, a user of all this technology that's out here. And I'm just not very educated on it. I don't do it personally. I don't even have a debit card. Um, I've got to go back and force myself to come more tech savvy. Uh, if not, I, uh, you know, I'm lost during a lot of these uh, discussions that we're having because I've never done it, you know, so I I've really have no idea about how it works. So I'm going to go back and uh, get with my children and my nieces and nephews and see if they can help me become a little bit more tech savvy by the next year. I can confirm that because Vern was joking around with everybody and said, I don't have a phone. And people were like, yeah, he probably doesn't. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much right. <laughs> Yeah, well, he's got them right at home. They should be running the business. Well, yeah, I told them, I said, I got a lot of apps, but I bought this phone at trade day, and they already had them on there. But I, I had some people last night uh, ask me about my online shopping. I said, oh, yeah, I'm a heavy user. They said, well, where do you shop at? And I said, uh, app store. <laughs> All right. So anyone, uh, anyone else like to add anything? Jeff, you see the industry uh, and do a lot in the industry. Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, my, my biggest takeaway was certainly the digital technology piece from Gray yesterday in the YEO breakout. I mean, um, you know, being a little younger and uh, understanding technology a little bit, it's just still mind blowing for me how much that we anticipate that it will continue to evolve even over the short term and then you know later into you know the ten years down the road. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of uh, investment that comes with, you know, keeping up with that type of technology and navigating, you know, what technology you choose to go with and how it integrates with other aspects of technology that you incorporate in other aspects of your business. So there's just a lot to it and uh, just found it very interesting. And Gray Taylor was great for our, uh, if you didn't attend the YEO breakout session. It, essentially, everything's going to be coming together. Uh, whether you think it or not, everything's going to be interrelated, the apps, loyalty and payment systems. Uh, it was a real eye-opening session. Um, I don't, it was that your biggest takeaway? And uh, we, we had the pleasure of having uh, Jeremy Myron, uh, who was our YEO board chairman uh, at Road Ranger, when he was with Road Ranger, just uh, was one of the real innovators, even at a young age, in this whole industry and in driving some of that technology. So he was great. All right, next. Anything else jump out at you? I think the... Um when speaking about the importance of commissary, if, if you're not building sandwiches or whatnot on site, morning part being our busiest time, 
Doors deep dive into what is the best possible product and see, you know, seeking out a manufacturer and developing a private label and working with the distribution partner to make sure that they get it. I mean, there's a lot of steps involved, but clearly we think there's you know, a lot of opportunity in the privatization and customization of those items, so. That did come up a lot in some of the breakout sessions and uh, in, in the sessions up here, in getting manufacturers more involved in promotions and in the process and the development of products. It, it's kind of always been on a wish list, but you, you should be dictating those terms, right? And telling them what you need I and do. not wishing. <laughs> I do do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And usually when I work with a manufacturer, I set you know, certain parameters, what am I looking for? Because I want a partner. Mm -hmm. I can buy stuff from anybody, but I'm looking, you know, somebody who really wants to grow with us and, and be a big part of our portfolio, so. Yeah. You agree, Brad? I do, and I think the conversation on um, recently, the issues with supply side that we've all been facing has forced us, as well as uh, our vendor partners, to look at things differently the old process of how we acquired product and had product delivered has challenged us because it's, it's, not, it's not working right now. Mm -hmm. So we have to go out and find, change our thinking, find new ways, new partners of, uh, to get products and services that we need. And I remember the one retailer talked about the sitting down with the vendors and the top to top meetings and laying out the vision, the strategy, their mm -hmm. needs and then sending them back, to, how can you meet that need? I, think mm -hmm. that, I thought that was an excellent point. We all meet with vendors, but I think to have a focused uh, session like that with them was a, was a good takeaway. And lay it out, be honest in what you need. Yep. All right, we have about two and a half minutes left. So any other feedback from anybody like to add anything? You can look at me, Vern. I'm not gonna call on you again, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we can wrap up. Uh, again, I want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, it has been uh, a real eye-opening conference. I thought the content was great and the level of sharing and participation.